to Revere High, class of 1951. Now you know how old I am. R E V E R E R H S. Cheer, Revere High. You want to hear the rest? I know the whole song. Yes, please. Yeah, yes. Yeah, right. Go ahead. Go, we go, got the team. We got the steam. We got the will to do or die. Die. Roll down that field again. Watch those go by. Go on and fight, 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 fight for Revere High. I used to go to the football game. Yeah. So I didn't. I didn't care about football. I went to see the boys. <laughs> Woo! Hello, hi, hello, hi, Mishan. Fantastic. My God, the soul you have given me is pure. You created it, you shaped it, you breathed it into me, and you protect it within me. Oh, love the prayers. I love the words. Fantastic. Awesome. Um, so I need to go to my library again to get to the Torah. Here's the Torah. So, um, so to begin tonight, while we have Cynthia's internet why cynthia you want to start tonight hopefully we can get this going for you the eternal one spoke to moses saying command aaron and his sons thus this is the ritual of the burnt offering the burnt offering itself shall remain where it is burned upon the altar all night until morning while the fire on the altar is kept going on it the priest shall dress in linen raiment with linen breech breeches next to his body and shall, shall take up the ashes to which the fire has reduced the burnt offering on the altar and place them beside the altar. He shall then take off his vestments and put on other vestments and carry the ashes outside the camp to a pure place. The fire on the altar shall be kept burning, not to go out. Every morning the priest shall feed wood to it lay out the burnt offering on it and turn into smoke the fat parts of the offering of well-being. A perpetual fire shall be kept burning on the altar, not to go out. And this is the ritual of the meal offering. Aaron's son shall present it before the eternal in front of the altar. A handful of the choice flour and oil of the meal offering shall be taken from it. with all the frankincense that is on the meal offering, and this token portion shall be turned into smoke on the altar as a pleasing odor to the eternal. What is left of it shall be eaten by Aaron and his sons. It shall be eaten as unleavened cakes in the sacred precinct. They shall eat it in the enclosure of the tent of meeting. It shall not be baked with leaven. I have given it as their portion from my offerings by fire. It is most holy, like the purgation offering and the reparation offering. Only the males among Aaron's descendants may eat of it, as they are due for all time throughout the ages from the eternal's offerings by fire. Anything that touches these shall become holy. Okay, okay hold on, hold on for just one second, if I may. Okay, what would be the difference between a matzah that we're going to have in Passover and these offerings that were being made with meal? Well, these offerings are a holy um, unleavened, and the ones that we have at, at Passover time is because we had to rush out of Egypt and they didn't have time to have the matzah rise. Yes, the but the, the yes, but, yes, but they're both unleavened. So, what is the difference? Well, oh, the difference in the in the actual matzah uh, made with um, the oil, right? So either so they they could have had two types. 
either yeah. one with uh, oil, you know, in other words, that the um, oh. the meal, uh, the the uh, grains with oil, or grains with oil plus incense. Oh, and I see. I see. And it was the incense, the thing that gave you the nice smell. So if someone was rich, they would bring it in with incense because they could afford it. Incense was very, very expensive. So that's the difference between these types of cakes, if I may call them like that, and uh -huh. the matzah that we have for Passover. Uh huh. Very, very interesting. So if you make me feel incensed, that means you make me smell good, right? Oh, okay. I just want to make sure I understand. Okay. Right. <laughs> That's a good one, Gary. <laughs> yeah, little humor here, little Torah study humor. <laughs> Can you continue, Cynthia? Please? Okay, I was at 12, right? Correct, yes. yeah. The Eternal One spoke to Moses saying, this is the offering that Aaron and his son shall offer to the Eternal on the occasion of his anointment, a tenth of an ephah of choice flour as a regular meal offering, half of it in the morning and half of it in the evening, shall be prepared with oil on a griddle. You shall bring it to well-soaked and offer it as a meal offering of baked slices of pleasing odor to the Eternal. And so shall the priest, anointed from among his sons to succeed him, prepare it, prepare it. It is the Eternals, a law for all time, to be turned entirely into smoke. So too, every meal offering of a priest shall be a whole offering. It shall not be eaten. The Eternal One spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons thus. This is the ritual of the purgation offering. The purgation offering shall be slaughtered before the Eternal at the... Let's see. At the spot where the burnt offering is slaughtered, it is most holy. The priest who offers it as a purgation offering shall eat of it, shall be eaten in the sacred precinct, in the enclosure of the tent of meeting. Anything that touches its flesh shall become holy. And if any of its blood is spattered upon a garment, you shall wash the bespattered part in the sacred precinct. An earthen vessel in which it was boiled shall be broken. If it was boiled... I think it's... Um... It might be good to pause here because he noticed the commentary underneath it says anything that touches these shall become holy. Uh, they say the translation follows the Talmudic authorities and Rashi. The, the quality of holiness is transmitted by contact as an electrical charge passes from one conductor to another. Thus, if meat from a Shalamim sacrifice comes into contact with a Minka, it becomes most holy, most holy, and may then be eaten only by priests in the sanctuary. Yeah, aminka is like a custom, okay? Mm -hmm. It's a custom, okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. All right. So let me go to the next page. Okay. So it was, oops. It, if it was boiled, that's it. That's it. If it was boiled. Okay, let me find it now. Let's see. Hmm. What number is that? Or... Well, if it if it was boiled in a cop, copper vessel. Oh, okay. In a copper vessel, it shall be scoured and rinsed with water. Only the males in the priestly line may eat of it. It is most holy. But no purgation offering may be eaten from which any blood is brought into the tent of meeting. For expiation in the sanctuary, any such shall be consumed in fire. This is the ritual of the purgation offering. It is most holy. The reparation offering shall be slaughtered at the spot where the burnt offering is slaughtered, and the blood shall be dashed on all sides of the altar. All its fat shall be offered, the broad teal, the fat that covers the entrails, the two kidneys and the fat that is on them at the loins, and the protuberance on the liver, which shall be removed with the kidneys. The priest shall turn them into smoke on the altar as an offering by fire to the eternal. It is a reparation offering. Only the meals in the priestly line may eat of it. It shall be eaten in the sacred precinct. It is most holy. The reparation offering is like the purgation offering. The same rule applies to both. It shall belong to the priest who makes expiation thereby. So too the priest who offers a person's burnt offering shall keep the skin of the burnt offering that was offered. Further, any meal offering that is baked in an oven and any that is prepared in a pan or on a griddle, 
shall belong to the priest who offers it. But every other meal offering with oil mixed in or dry shall go to the sons of Aaron all alike. This is the ritual of the sacrifice of well-being that one may offer to the eternal. One who, one who offers it for thanksgiving shall offer together with the sacrifice of thanksgiving unleavened hmm, cakes with oil mixed in, unleavened wafers spread with oil, and cakes of choice flour with oil mixed in well soaked. This offering with cakes of leavened bread added shall be offered along with one's thanksgiving sacrifice of well-being. Out of this, the person shall offer one of each kind as a gift to the eternal. It shall go to the priest who dashes the blood of the offering of well-being. And the flesh of the thanksgiving sacrifice of well-being shall be eaten on the day that it is offered. None of it shall be set aside until morning. If, however, the sacrifice is offered as a votive of a free will offering, it shall be eaten on that day that one offers the sacrifice, and what is left of it shall be eaten on the morrow. What is then left of the flesh of the sacrifice shall be consumed in fire on the third day. If any of the flesh of the sacrifice's well-being is eaten on the third day, it shall not be acceptable. It shall not count for the one who offered it. It is an offensive thing, and the person who eats of it shall bear the guilt. Flesh that touches anything impure shall not be eaten. It shall be consumed in fire. As for other flesh, only one who is pure may eat such flesh. Okay, can, first... we hold on? can we hold only here for a second? Mm -hmm. uh, a point that we need to make, because we just read it, uh, is that uh, you must consume the flesh within two days. Sure, it'll spoil otherwise. Right, yeah. oh, exactly. Refrigeration. Exactly. Right. Right. They didn't have little refrigerators with them. Yep. <laughs> And the other thing that comes up here is a Thanksgiving sacrifice, which I find somewhat interesting, isn't it? Because the other ones are for atonement of sins or things that went wrong. Now, is this just, let's give thanks. Let's give thanks yeah. to God. Is that what we're seeing here? Is that what? Yeah, sounds we're... good to me. Yeah, <laughs> finally something good. Hey, uh, we did it right. Hey, um, and then the, also the votive or free will offering. I know that free will offering, we'll, we'll be talking about that um i'm just trying i'm going to come down i don't know if you have uh oh here's here it is down here in the um in the commentary brought for a vow whether conditional or outright so if someone makes a vow they'll, they'll bring a sacrifice a free will offering presumably brought without prior commitment so maybe is it is this something like maybe they're storing an offering they're trying to get you know raise their offering so that they in case something bad does happen they, i don't know I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Ruthie, I was hoping you'd dive into the, the, the uh, you know, your I, I have to be honest. I'm really looking forward to the, the chapters after this, because this is the end, pretty much, of the sacrifices of the yeah. uh, Pashas. And I have to be honest, I don't find it scintillating. I have to no, be no. It's better when, you know, Moses comes down with the tablets and the yeah, right. calf is out there and then everyone's going wild. And it's a little more, it's definitely Cecil B. DeMille. This is right. a sleeper. Yeah. Do you want to take a break, Cynthia? <laughs> Cynthia, you did so well. Oh, well, for once you heard my voice. Yeah, well, clear as a We bell. always hear your voice. Do you want to take a break or you want to keep no, going? No, that's fine. I'll, I'll go on. Okay. So, Flesh that touches anything impure shall not be eaten. It shall be consumed in fire. As for other flesh, only one who is pure may eat such flesh. But the person who in a state of impurity eats flesh from the eternal sacrifices of well-being that person shall be cut off from kin. When a person touches anything impure, be it human impurity or an impure animal or any impure creature and eats flesh from the eternal sacrifices of well-being, that person shall be cut off from kin. And the eternal one spoke to Moses saying, speak to the Israelite people thus, you shall eat no fat of ox or sheep or goat. Fat from animals that died or were, turned by, were torn by beasts may be put to any use, but you must not eat it. If anyone eats the fat of animals from which offerings by fire may be made to the eternal, the person who eats it shall be cut off from his kin. And you must not consume any blood either of bird or of animal in any of your settlements. Anyone who eats blood shall be cut off from kin. Now, before we go on, I just want to mention something. 
You know, I find this really very interesting because if this is for all, if this is like for all time going on, you would think that this is really an important thing for us to understand that we should never be eating fat of any animal, not only because it's bad for cholesterol and stuff like that, but it is, it, they say it's impure. And, you know, I think that for people that do keep kosher, forgetting all the crazy laws and all with the dishes and everything, this makes much more sense that you're eating something pure, not the fat, not the, you know, all the, the stuff that isn't really good for you. There's nothing good in fat, okay? So I just think that's interesting because if we really followed it now in the, in the modern times, it would really keep us healthy. Yeah. And pure, and pure, you know. And blood too. We have salt our meat so that all the blood. That's came right. Out. And, and that, that they they tell you not to eat rare meat because it's really unhealthy compared to having it cooked better. You know, it mm -hmm. doesn't have to be well done, but you should have it cooked so there's no red blood showing. Doctor Michael. Okay, and a, a point that I would like to make in here. This this, this is beyond the uh, the fat and, and the blood and so on, which I agree with. Okay. Right. Notice that all of these paragraphs that we have, it says the eternal one spoke to Moses saying to Moses, speak to the Israelite people thus. So why doesn't it say, Moses said to the people, you shall eat no fat of ox or sheep or goat. Why does he have to say that the eternal one said to Moses and then Moses said to us? Mm. Because God only spoke to Moses, right? And then Moses. Yeah, but why? Why would? Uh, why wouldn't it just say, you know, on twenty-two, says um, the Eternal spoke to Moses. Uh, number twenty-three says, "Speak to the Israelite people." Okay, so why doesn't it say? Why do? Why does it have to say all of that over and over and over again? It could. It could have said, "Moses said, you shall not eat no fat of ox or sheep or goat." Blah, blah, blah. So for why because it's the eternal one speaking to Moses and Moses is only the messenger. Okay. The reason is is that this provides authority to that those particular rules. Oh. That sounds that sounds good to me. Yep. Yeah. Can I That's add can I good. add something? Yes. Can I, can I add? Um sounds almost similar starting out to like what Dr. Mike is saying. So many uh, verses in the Torah. In Hebrew, via the bear at an oil Moshe le more da bear el bene Israel, and God spoke to Moses saying, "Speak to the children of Israel." Why is this portion sav? Speak to you know Marin and command. Why does it say command instead of just speak to? And I I, I read a commentary once that said that when and this was something I think from Rashi. That the reason is because in the beginning of this portion, the first sacrifice is the elevation offering, the Ola. Oh. And that's the burnt offering. And that's the one where, you know, after it's burnt, you know, in the next morning, the priest has to change, take off the priestly robes, they have to put on the clothing, they have to remove. So the idea is that God is using the command instead of just saying, speak to to denote a kind of zealousness for paying attention to this mitzvah because of the fact that the priests, their sustenance comes from so many of the animal sacrifices they get to eat. That's their compensation for, you know, helping the person do the sacrifice. Like that's their compensation. And based on human nature, like Rashi is saying, that, and these other rabbis are saying that the Torah, like it understands the human nature that a priest is still a human being and may not be as inclined to perform a mitzvah for which they gain nothing. Some of them may get to not care as much about doing it. It may not seem as important, it may not even seem worth doing, but it's, that's why they're commanded to do it. And what is the lesson from that? The lesson, and the reason I'm saying this is because I've, I've led, I used to lead services and I used to do divas all the time. You know, I've talked about this a lot of times, but I think the lesson that you learn from that is that the reward for 
performing a mitzvah is the mitzvah itself. Oh, I you know, see. Um, you, you know, like here with God is, you know, the priests perform this because they're supposed to. It's part of their, they might not gain, you know, they don't get anything to eat out of it or anything because it's a totally burnt offering. But they're still supposed to perform that mitzvah, you know, with the same zealousness that they do all the other ones where they do gain something. Mm. So I just wanted to throw that mishmash out there. I'll keep my mouth shut. <laughs> I love it. I actually oh, think I that's it. very important. It really is. Yeah. The, the mitzvah is the is the big part of all this. Yeah. yeah. And I can you can kind of see too where uh, if the priests through the generations they might get, you know, they might go astray a little bit because we're all human, right? And they and they might forget these things, you know. So, and I'm thinking of. Um, before Samuel, it was Eli. Eli was the high, the high priest in the temple, and and that's when the, his sons went kind of astray. And and the Lord spoke to Samuel and said, "I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to take you know Eli is going to go away because he wasn't properly uh, taking care of the temple." So it's a, I think it's a it's a lesson for all time, as we say. Uh, does anyone want to start at twenty eight? I will. And the eternal one spoke to Moses saying, speak to the Israelite people. Thus the offering to the eternal from a sacrifice of well-being must be presented by the one who offers that sacrifice of well-being to the eternal. One's own hands shall present the eternal's offering by fire. The offering shall present the fat with the breast the breast to be elevated as an elevation offering before the eternal. Boy, that's interesting that the breast is elevated, which is, I think, fascinating, you know, because the breast has fatty tissue. <laughs> that's why I was thinking. Of. The priest shall turn the fat into smoke on the altar and the breast shall go to Aaron and his sons and the right thigh from your sacrifices of well-being, you shall present it to the priest as a gift. He from among Aaron's sons who offers the blood and the fat of the offering of well-being shall get the right thigh as his portion. For I have taken the breast of elevation offering and the thigh of gift offering from the Israelites from their sacrifices of well-being and given them to Aaron, the priest, and to his sons as their due from the Israelites for all time. This is very heavy duty, you know. Those shall be the prerequisites of Aaron and the prerequisites of his sons from the eternal's offerings by fire. Once they have been inducted to serve the eternal as priests, these the eternal commanded to be given them once they had been anointed as, as a due from the Israelites for all time. For I have taken the breast of elevation offering and the thigh of gift offering from the Israelites from their sacrifices of well-being and given them to Aaron the priest and to his sons to their due from the Israelites for all time. I thought I just read that. Okay. Those shall be the prerequisites of Aaron and the prerequisites of his sons from the eternal offerings by fire. Once they've been inducted to serve the eternal as priests, these are the eternal commanded to be given them once they had been anointed as a due from the Israelites for all time throughout the ages. Okay, could we just stop in here for a second? Sure. Make a comment. We have read enough in here so that, you know, the animals come in, uh, you uh, take out the fat, uh, you uh, separate the blood, so forth and so on, and then you do the burnt offering. In present times, in order to take meat and make it kosher, the... Um, person who is doing the slaughtering or somebody else has to come in and remove the sciatic nerve. Then and only then is that particular animal, the back part of the animal, kosher to eat. And this goes back, uh, you know, to the time when um, um, uh, Israel, uh, remember his name, he became Israel. Um, Jacob. 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 Uh, the, the angel touched his thigh and he became, okay, that was the sciatic nerve. Uh. Notice that in these days that we're talking about in here, we, you did not need to do that in order to, to make the animal kosher. Hmm. 
And is also, is that part of why they talk about the right thigh so much? Is it? Correct. Correct. Okay. Hmm. But, uh, you know, in these days, you know, right now, in order to kosher the meat, you have got to take the sciatic nerve from both sides. Otherwise, that um, meat will not be kosher. Hmm. Oh, I never knew that. Um, where, is that where is that written in the Torah? Uh, it's actually not in the Torah. It's part of the... Uh, oh, I, I'm, I'm glad that you asked Probably the Midrash then. It's in the Midrash. Yeah, well, it, it will be in the Talmud. Okay. In the Talmud, right. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, you know, what? what and, and I think that we've said this before, but this is a good time for us to go over it again because it doesn't say that anywhere in the Tanakh. Okay. So, right. So what, right. We're reading in, what we're reading in here is the biblical side. <laughs> What we're, the, we're then talking about as far as taking out the sciatic nerve, that is the rabbinic side. So it's the rabbis who came up with that, but the, the priests never had to do that up until the destruction of the second temple. They I understand. A lot of things changed as far as the explanation of the laws until after the second temple. That I do understand. And I also understand that that's where a lot of things get mixed up with with Jews in general, because some people say, look at it, it wasn't said in the Torah. And, you know, then the rabbi said this. So there's a whole big, you know, controversy about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyways, where was I? Where was I reading? 37. I just want to welcome Jordan Shapiro and Dr. Ed Weiner hey. to the Torah Study Underground. Hey. Somehow we lost hey. Myrna. I don't know where Myrna went, but I, I think hope Myrna couldn't hear or something. Oh. Okay. All right. 37. 37, such are the rituals of the burnt offering, the meal offering, the purgation offering, the reparation offering, the offering of ordination, and the sacrifice of well-being, with which the eternal charged the, oops, sorry, uh, Moses on Mount, uh, charged Moses on Mount Sinai, when commanding that the Israelites pr present their offerings to the eternal in the wilderness of Sinai. The eternal one spoke to Moses saying, take Aaron along with his sons, and the vestments, the anointed oil, the bull of purgation offering, the two rams and the basket of unleavened bread, and assembled the community leadership at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Moses did as the eternal commanded him. And when the leadership was assembled at the entrance of the tent of meeting, Moses said to the leadership, this is what the eternal has commanded to be done. Then Moses brought Aaron and his sons forward and washed them with water. He put the tunic on him, girded him with the sash, clothed him with the robe, and put the ephod on him, girding him with the decorated band with which he tied it to him. He put the breastplate on him and put into the breastplate the urim and the thummim, and he set the headdress on his head and on the on the if head, headdress on his head. Oh, and on headdress in front, he put the gold frontlet, the holy diadem, as the eternal had commanded Moses. Moses took the anointed oil and the anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it, thus concentrating them. He sprinkled some of it on the altar seven times, anointing the altar, all its utensils and the laver with its stand to concentrate them. He poured them of the anointed oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. Moses then brought Aaron's sons forward, clothed them in the tunics, girded them with the sashes and wound turbans upon them as the eternal had commanded Moses. He led forward the bull of purgation offering. Aaron and his sons laid their hands upon the head of the bull of purgation offering and it was slaughtered. Moses took the blood and with his finger put some on each of the horns of the altar, purifying the altar. Then he poured out the blood at the base of the altar. Thus he consecrated it in order to make expiation upon it. Why would he put the finger of the blood on the horns, though, if it's supposed to not be pure? God said to. What? God told him to. That was one of the instructions. Okay, okay. I just was, okay. Moses then took all the fat that was about the entrails and the protuberance of the liver and the two kidneys and their fat and turned them into smoke on the altar. The rest of the bull, its hide, its flesh, and its dung 
he put to the fire outside the camp, as the Eternal had commanded Moses. Uh, oops. Then he brought forward the ram of burnt offering. Aaron and his sons laid their hands upon the ram's head, and it was slaughtered. Moses dashed the blood against all sides of the altar. The ram was cut up into sections, and Moses turned the head, the sections, and the suet into smoke on the altar. Moses washed the entrails and the legs with water and turned all of the ram into smoke. This was a burnt offering for a pleasing odor an offering by fire to the eternal, as the eternal had commanded Moses. He brought forward the second ram, the ram of ordination. Aaron and his sons laid their hands upon the ram's head, and it was slaughtered. Moses took some of its blood and put it on the ridge of Aaron's right ear and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big one, I'm sorry, the big toe of his right foot. Moses then brought forward the sons of Aaron and put some of the blood on the ridges of their right ears and on the thumbs of their right hands and on the big toes of their right feet. Right feet, right foot. <laughs> and the rest of oh, the feet, I used to have both of them. And the rest of the blood Moses dashed against every side of the altar. He took the fat, the broad tail, all the fat about the entrails, the protuberance of the liver and the two kidneys in their fat and the right thigh. From the basket of unleavened bread, that was before the eternal, he took one cake of unleavened bread, one cake of oil bread, and one wafer, and placed them on the fat pots and on the right thigh. He placed all these on the palms of Aaron and on the palms of his son, and elevated them as an elevation offering before the eternal. Then Moses took them from their hands and turned them into smoke on the altar with the burnt offering. That was an ordination offering for a pleasing odor. It was an offering by fire to the eternal. Moses took the breast and elevated. Oops, what just happened? Oops, stand by. Technical yes. difficulties. <laughs> Wait a minute. Moses took the breast. Okay, we're at the bottom. I'll bring that okay, up. Okay, Moses over the middle. Took the breast and elevated it to elevate upon the eternal. It was Moses's. Next page. Or I'm just I'm just wondering about ordination. Uh, so this is they're they're getting or, ordained here, correct? This is kind of like the or, ordination ritual. The um, is that it looks like that's what it looks like, right? Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, what I find interesting is that can you imagine doing this at that time? The amount of details that they had to follow, and they were people that weren't used to following details. Just think about all the stuff they had to follow. I mean, that was a lot of stuff to follow. That's a really. And good I was point. thinking that the writing was brilliantly done with such detail that you couldn't imagine that this was not really happening. It was like you're know, seeing every single detail, right? Such imagine right. unimaginable detail. I know. It's, it was like everything had to be done a certain way. It just had to be true. Yeah. <laughs> it was really interesting. It, you where, know, did I, where am I now? Uh, uh, I think you're on. Well, go ahead, Dr. Ed. Yeah. Jordan, you know, I would, all I could think of, and, and, and I, not, to be, not to laugh about this, but all I could think of is, is the certification exams that, and registry exams that I had to take. And you had to take the bar. Yeah. This is this is as detailed as taking the bar test, the bar examination. Yeah. To be to be a professional, to be at this level, you had to know what to do. And it created a level of expertise and a level of awe. I think that's the word, a level of awe, A W E, right. that surrounded that surrounded uh, the high priest. And whenever he did all these things, he knew what to do, how to do it, how to prepare. And I think that is what they're trying to get here in many ways is this was a big deal. Yeah, very big deal. <laughs> yeah, and if they didn't get it right, what would happen, right? I mean, if we they knew. didn't get it right, they become a television producer. <laughs> oh. Good one. <laughs> low blow, low blow. Oh, I'm sorry. Did, did I see something funny? <laughs> right. 
That's yeah, why I'm not but... an electrician, because it would just blow up if I took a wire and I turned it. <laughs> Where did I stop? Can you help me? <laughs> well, I, 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 one, one, one other thing, you know, considering the fact that, you know, we're talking about being so precise and everything else. Remember, we have written, we have read several times that uh, before they uh, put the animals uh, in trails and things took him out, and before the animal goes uh, on top of the fire, they have to take out the protuberance of the, of the liver. Liver, I know. What is the name? What, what is the name of anatomically? What is the name of the protuberance of the liver? The diaphragm. Nope. No. Esophagus. Nope. No. Ready? What? The gallbladder. The oh. gallbladder. Oh. That's it. Oh boy. Oh. Because that's bitter too. If you eat that, it'd be very bitter. Oof. Oh, yeah. Next on Jeopardy, we will try. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I still I still lost my place. I'm sorry. Uh, 29. 29. I believe you're 29. Oh, 29. Okay. <laughs> Moses took the breast and elevated it as an elevation offering before the eternal. It was Moses' portion of the ram of ordination as the eternal had commanded Moses. And Moses took some of the anointing oil and some of the blood that was on the altar and sprinkled it upon Aaron and upon his vestments, and also upon his sons and upon the vestments. Thus, he consecrated Aaron and his vestments, and also his sons and their vestments. Moses, whoopsie, Happened keep again. on losing it. I don't know what. And, and, and Moses said to Aaron and his sons, boil the flesh at the entrance of the tent of meeting and eat it there with the bread that is in the basket of ordination, as I commanded. Aaron and his sons shall eat it. And what is left over of the flesh and the bread you shall consume in fire. You shall not go outside the entrance of the tent of meeting for seven days until the day that your period of ordination is completed. For your ordination will require seven days. Everything done today, the eternal has commanded to be done seven days to make expiation for you. You shall remain at the entrance of the tent of meeting day and night for seven days keeping the eternal's charge that, boop, 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 that you may not die, for so I have been commanded. And Aaron and his sons did all the things that the eternal had commanded through Moses. I believe that might be, yeah, that's our, that's our. Wow, portion. that was a quick, that was a quick wow. question. Wow. And so that was my point right there. If they didn't get it right, that oh. you may die. That that wow. whole so <laughs> it um uh, it could it they I mean I, I'm always thinking that this was such an amazing time, right? Because you have God completely interacting in the history of the world with humans, almost on a one-to-one -one level. Right. You're right. God's dividing the sea, God's speaking to Moses. And it's so important that they get all these things right that that you may not die, as it says. So I mean, there was a lot riding on this. I think. It's in, it's it's pretty intense. It's pretty intense. Yes, wow. it is. Well, that's okay, what okay, I mean. okay, Jordan. So you you need to tell us the sharpest joke, even though today is not Shabbos. <laughs> it could be any joke. <laughs> oh, I, I can only tell you that. Um, let me get this right because I haven't uh, told this one to you. I have a I have a cute one in the office that I thought I was going to use last Saturday morning, but of course there was no service, so I missed my mother's shot sighted. I missed the service. I was telling you this great joke that you'll have to wait until next Saturday uh, when it's my <laughs> father's shot sight. But in any event, so the one that I I thought was kind of cute was, uh, what sounds like a sneeze, but is actually made of leather. Hmm. Ah, shoo! Is that stupid or what? I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, shoo. Uh, oh, uh, gosh, that's bad. a good one. I like that one. <laughs> Short and sweet. That's great. That's great. So how's everyone else doing? How are you doing, Janice? How's, how's Bracha? Hi. Hi. Hi, Bracha. Hi. Oh, it's nice to see everybody. It is. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm telling you, when we don't have service on Saturday mornings, I feel like I'm missing out on something, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's really tough. Ruth, are you going out in your balcony to look at beautiful Revere Beach where you are now? 
No, I'm not in Revere Beach. <laughs> I know. That's why I'm joking with you. <laughs> you don't have, you're missing the view, right? Uh, don't miss it at all. <laughs> I wondered. I thought you were going to say that. <laughs> I actually, uh, what you don't know, in front of my um, apartment building here, we have two beautiful uh, fish ponds with fish in it. And it's just beautiful. Oh, really? And they keep, listen to this. I couldn't understand how the fish survive in the freezing cold. I just it's found out from uh, our... Um, what was it called? My uh, janitor here that they keep heat in these ponds, and that's how the fish survive. Do you know that these goldfish are no kidding, are this big? It's huge. They're like seven inches long. They're well, called koi. They're what? called koi, C O Y, koi, oh. K O Y. Oh, and so they're not like regular goldfish? No, they're very expensive. They're huge. We have like at least 30 of them. I want, you to read, I want you to think about this, everybody. There would be no life on earth if ice did not float. That yeah. when, water, when, when water freezes, its density is lowered. There would be no life on earth if ice wow. didn't lose density. And look, okay. at, we're losing a lot of ice because when I was in Alaska, this was way over 10 years ago, okay. I saw already the glaciers all broken up. It wasn't like a nice flat glacier uh, I, anymore. Hold on, I, I, hold on, Ed, explain to everybody why, if, if um, ice was not of a lower density, why there would be no life on Earth. Can you explain that to everybody, please? Sure. In the beginning of evolution, all life was aquatic. And during the ice age, where they, everything would have died that was above the ice, but fish and bacteria and all of the, all of the animals of the, of the sea uh, did not die during the ice age because the ice floated up and they were oh. able to, to survive, to survive okay. underneath the water. And from then, as you know, that the fish ultimately, millions of years, gained legs and walked on land, became amphibians, and then reptiles, and then and then uh, humans, or not humans, but many states, uh, mammals and whatever, and there are many twists and turns. But if... if all right, now, since, since I have to leave because I'm actually giving a Zoom at 8.30, but mm -hmm. I have the Shabbos joke for everybody, and I know that Jordan knows the joke, but this is for everybody else. I won't tell everybody the punchline. <laughs> okay. do, do you guys know that 99% of lawyers give the rest a bad name? Ooh. <laughs> let me tell you something. Let me let me give you my 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 uh, very timely uh, humor of the week, and that is, and I you may have heard me tell you this one before, but they may not be selling beer at Fenway Park this year, and why is that? You ask. Well, yeah. if the Red Sox lose the opener. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, yay, Jordan! Yay! Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. He did That's it again. Really funny. That's really. But I do want to mention one thing that I am concerned about: these little ice, um, the uh, glaciers that are breaking up. What's happened is that down in um, in Antarctica, what's really sad is that the penguins and the polar bears really have no they need ice to survive they and they're know. they just don't have it anymore and it's really a problem i mean we have to find a way to to have these penguins and the um polar bears survive because they're in big trouble you're yeah, right well if we have one more year of pandemic maybe all that ice will come back because we're not gonna be in our cars but i don't want <laughs> hey i'm not i'm not asking for anything please please i'm not asking <laughs> for anything lord have mercy yes <laughs> But um, as always, this is an amazingly short week, and it's uh, right. fascinating. Anything else, Janice? How are you? Um, oh, let me see. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. <laughs> I enjoyed what was said tonight. With everything, that's good. And um, I hope to look through this week and mm -hmm. read it all in the background. Yeah. Definitely have yeah. nice weather like Michael has down in Florida mm. in the 60s, finally. 
What's your temperature, Michael, today? You, you mean down here? I yes, think that, correct. Uh, that I, I actually, think. actually today was, was, was a little cool. It only got up to 81. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the other thing too, the other thing too is that, you know, my wife and I were downstairs in the afternoon sitting, but you know, the sun was behind the building. So we had no sun and there was a tiny little, verb, a little tiny bit of breeze. It actually is lower humidity. So in a way it was cool. That's nice. That's good. It was actually cool, uh, amazingly enough. That's well, nice. anyway, I have to go. I have to tell you guys, I am giving a Zoom. I was asked. He, here is the uh, question that I am going to be presenting because I was given the question. Can science and religion coexist? That's a question yep. that's been going on for many yeah. centuries. <laughs> reason, I say yes. I say yes. I say yes, too. And the reason why they ask me is that uh, they know that I'm a scientist that actually believes in God. Good. Go. I'm it's glad to hear that. Good night, everybody. Good night. Have, have a great one. Day. I'm sure you do well. Cape Cod, and it's quite cold here. I don't know what it was in in around Boston today. Almost. Uh, Michael and Jordan. What was it? It was nice. 50. It was like 50 to 60 degrees today. Yeah. You look well, like you're up to your nice. neck in cranberries, Doctor. Uh, yeah, I had to come down to the I had to come down to the Cape to check on the house today on the farm, and it's quite cold here. It is quite oh. cold. I heard that it's colder in the Cape because there was something about more of a um, um, uh, you know breeze on the ocean. Sea breeze, that was yeah, one. the yeah. sea breeze. We're, we're, yeah. It's cold here. Yeah, and incidentally, people... Jordan, that's what I don't miss about a Revere is that. Where I used to come out of that back entrance where you used to pick me up, oh, yeah. that wind was like 10 to 15 degrees colder than Malden. And I was only five minutes away from Malden. So that's why I don't miss, um, because it, was, it wasn't the cold so much. It was like you would be, I would be blown across the street. I, <laughs> and you know me, I'm short. I'm not going to go to, I'm not going to be able to stay on the ground. <laughs> oh, my God. So. What were you going to say, Cynthia? I'm sorry. Oh, I, I don't know. My mind was going to ask, but I just want to tell you that I grew up in Revere and mm -hmm. Revere Beach. When I grew up, there was two roller coasters, two flying horses, oh, I know there was that. everything. Yeah. And right. I loved it. It was wonderful. There was a party going on all the time. Yeah, it's a different Revere or... now, though. Cynthia. Oh, it's I know. Different. I know. And you could walk the streets any hour of the day yeah. and night. It was lovely. Do you know, know that Revere is one of the last of the few towns still in the red? Cynthia, Very did you weird. ever go on the cyclone? I never <laughs> went on any. I was scared stiff. <laughs> I did when mother, I was a kid. I my mother I rode everything, but I, I was fearful. I did ride the flying horses and a boy once took me on the whip in the Dodgers on a date. But beyond yeah. that, no. I want you to know when I was six years old, all I wanted to do was go on those boats that you ring the bell on. You remember oh, the, the nautical. Boat? Yeah. yeah. So let me tell you what happened. My brother, who was eight years older than me, said, you do that after you go on my rides. And he forced me on the double Ferris wheel for my first ride at six oh, years wow. old. That's so that was my player. introduction to the amusement park. I remember <laughs> Jerry Williams on the radio. He used to say... <laughs> Shirley Ave was the only place in the world that you could place a bet in 40 different languages. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> yeah, well, my wife was a Pugs Corner girl. So was I. I used to go, to, used to go from Malden to meet her at Pugs Corner. Yeah, I was there every day. <laughs> lots of Jews hung out. But something yeah. else in the 60s. I don't yeah. know. I'm out there on the 30s. Pumps Corner is the, uh, yeah. is, is the, what are they called? The band. Uh, oh, the band. Yeah, the band stand. The band stand. Yeah. The band stand. The band stand, right. Listen, I, like I said, I, I lived there for nine years. And as much as um, I liked the ocean, I was very happy to move out Michael, of there. Michael, where did you grow up? I grew up in a little place called Walton Mountain. I don't know if you've in ever heard state? of it. In, in what state? In what state? Um, West Springfield. Walton Mountain, really? <laughs> yeah, the Waltons. That's he's the Waltons. Waltons. Oh, you were one of them. Annie got me. Annie got me. <laughs> West, West Springfield. I was in West, West Springfield, oh, which is you west the of Springfield. Part of the state. Yeah, Western Mass. Good night, so it's beautiful Michael. there. Good night. <laughs> Good night, John Boy. Good night, Mary Good night. Ellen. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>
let me close this by just giving to Revia High, class of 1951. Now you know how old I am. R E V E R E R H S. Cheer Via High. You want to hear the rest? I know the yes. whole song. Yes, please. Yeah, yes. Yeah, right. Go ahead. Go, we go, got the team. We got the steam. We got the will to do or die. Die. Roll down that field again. Watch those go by. Go on and fight, 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 fight. For Revia High. I used wow. to call the football yeah. game. So I didn't. I didn't care about football. I went to see the boys. <laughs> Woo! And that's Woo the truth. And that's At my age, truth. it's time to make a full confession. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Who's got the expiation offering? <laughs> we got oh, my. You guys right. are wonderful. Good night, Cynthia. All you right. Always. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody.